Oh, before this picture is won, some will have to get thrown in jail some more, but we shall overcome. Don't worry about us. Before the victory is won, some of us will lose jobs, but we shall overcome. Before the victory is won, even some will have to face physical death. Physical death is the price that some must pay to free their children from a permanent psychological death. Then nothing shall be more redemptive. We shall overcome. An opportunity to discover uh, a venue in Providence, Rhode Island, ASU 20, uh, which is a uh, ops program and a, a nonprofit in Providence that deals with the ops. And one of the things they had was a, 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 a youth slam and uh, an adult slam team, which is slam is composition poetry. And I had walked into this venue and but as I said, one candle can light a thousand others. My candle was lit even further um, by one of the uh, poets and organizers that was working there, who were going to have the honor of, of, of listening to speak and, and perhaps performing a piece. Um, his name is Jared Paul. He is a writer and a performance artist, a community organizer from Providence, Rhode Island. He is a two-time individual World Poetry Slam finalist and an eight-time coach of the Providence National Youth Slam Team, which placed second in the nation at Brave New Voices in 2007. Having toured throughout US, Canada, Europe, playing alongside acclaimed poets, musicians, journalists, and speakers such as Amy Goodwin, uh, Amy Goodman, Saul Williams, Sage Francis, Our Lady Peace, Paul Hawkins, Immortal Technique, Anti-flag and atmosphere, Jared is widely recognized as one of the premier performance poets in the world. His work appears in poetry collections and alternative teaching guides such as Write Bloody's forthcoming Learn Then Burn Anthology and Uncommon Core on Red Beard Press, as well in the, as well as in the Providence Journal, Socialist Worker, The Agenda, and more. In January of 2014, Jared was part of the largest protest related class action settlement in the United States history, Schiller versus the city of New York, whereby after a decade of fighting, plaintiffs in the New York City Civil Liberties Union defeated the NYPD and set a president in federal court against the constitutionality of group, of, uh, group probable cause. Jared is someone that lives the afterlife of his words. Some people speak words, and some people turn words into actions. He's a powerful speaker, a powerful artist, and uh, a committed, person to the agenda of changing the world, not just in terms of race and class, but also in terms of the environment. So please give a warm welcome to Jared Paul.
like to swim for sure, let them come, let them come. I've sharpened my tongue. Not scared of the deep, ain't afraid to see blood. Others pulled off the road, headed for home, sunk to the bottom, couldn't find a way to float. Low oxygen clothes like a vice up on your throat. No one hears a scream that can't survive on what it broke. But I'm still in the game. Castles on the board, crashing the door, forged Greyhound Pass, now I'm back on tour, strapped for war, merch in the bag, food packed back for more, lying in my throat with a fire to feed, explode out the bottle when the throttle release, small man, short teeth, much dirt undone and leads to go before I sleep. Now my father says, when you gonna get rich and make it? You can laugh when it's funny if you want to. Never! I ain't write the type of stuff that make you famous. But I get national press for protest arrests. I incite the type of stuff that might make you famous. My song is a deep sea alien that would explode in people's ears if Payola ever brought it to the surface of a top 40 playlist. I ain't faking. It's worth more than they could ever have been paid me. Who could own a tree like a native, not gangster, still the FBI hate me for being that rat who made it through the maze and never took the cheese when they gave it. It's amazing. I'm amazing. White trash ain't supposed to study wages. Socialist jokes? No? Just me? They want us poor, drunk, dumb, and making babies hooked on sports, God, porn, keep it brain dead, but I made it, out the matrix, native healers taught me how to shape shift, how to study race, class, and what the state is, I know capital is just exploited labor, and there's a whole lot more, but that's the basics, war is for profit, not national safety, training youth in genocide for a paycheck. I found the abyss before I knew what it was. Now I can't look away until we break it, but we gon' make it. I can taste it. Never been closer to making these type of changes. And I'm afraid, but I can't look away if that's what it take, man. Class war till they put me in a jail cell, but I don't want to be in no jail cell. You know? Thank you very much. writing and performing for a long time, and one of the most moving things that I have ever read in my life is uh, a letter from Birmingham Jail by Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, who we're here for today. Um, you know, and as Eric said a little while ago, MLK was arrested more than 30 times uh, in the course of his career for doing peaceful uh, direct action and uh, civil disobedience as were hundreds, as we saw in the movie, thousands and thousands of other organizers, and many local organizers that we never hear about. And, you know, some that were national figures too, but should get talked about as much as MLK, but they don't. You know, Ralph Abernathy, Freddie Lou Hamer, uh, Fred Hampton, all kinds of folks. Um, and I don't seek to ever go out to get arrested. I don't ever want to, you know, get arrested at a protest. But at the same time, as we saw in that movie, we, you know, we can't shy away from stuff because Voting is important, um, you know, and, and testifying at city council hearings are, is important, uh, but it's not enough. There needs to be more. There needs to be uh, additional action to back it up. So this is a, a, another protest poem in a totally different energy, but I would like to dedicate it uh, not only to MLK and the other organizers of the civil rights movement in the 60s, but folks in the civil rights movement uh, today, right now, in Ferguson and in New York City and in Boston and Chicago and Los Angeles and Oakland. Um, <coughs> So it was 1 a.m., and we had no business on the road. The weather reports that snow and freezing rain all night without a chance of clearing till the next day. When we set out from Providence, the storm was already coming down so hard that we couldn't see more than 15 feet in front of the van. But it was the 40th anniversary of the 1967 march from the Pentagon. We had been planning the trip for weeks, and nobody wanted to back out. The highway was scarcely plowed, 
for nearly the entire stretch of road that connected Rhode Island to Virginia. Cars were skidding out of control all around us, and the pavement was buried in white. As swirling gusts battered the windshield, I was acutely aware of the six other lives in the van for whom I was now responsible. I had never driven for over 200 miles straight at 35 miles per hour before, but even at a crawl, the time passed quick. Part of it was my intense concentration on the road and keeping as much distance in between us and any other moving vehicle on it as possible. Part of it was everyone talking about the war, and part of it was just a very tangible sense of mission. We were all invested in something we believed in, and it felt important. We saw many accidents. The saddest ones were the flipped over semi-trucks, mangled and twisted. All I could think was, Damn, I haven't felt close to God in a long time, but I feel like praying anyway. So while still vigorously scanning the road, I let part of my mind slip down to the panic room in my heart and pray to my mom, which I do sometimes. Dear Paula, beloved strength and earthly mother, thank you for this day which you have given me for the breath in my lungs and the strength in my mind. Please, Mom, don't let any of these truckers have died lonely and frozen when they should have been home with their families. Please, let the medics have gotten to them in time. Let them be wrapped in clean blankets at a warm hospital someplace close. I prayed for no more accidents for anyone and continued to regard the ice-covered highway with open suspicion, obsessively scanning terrain, ready for anything. I gave the wheel over to Alan someplace in Jersey and tried to sleep without much success. We split toll fare and took turns pumping gas. Being in those truck stops reminded me of being on tour, waking up in some strange place in the middle of the night, not knowing what time it is or even what state you're in. I thought of Tom and I thought of Francis, their faces clear in my mind. I wondered if their plane had landed in Texas yet. If they thought of me when they were out on the road, the road is a monster, Frank says. It chews us up and spits us out, and we're all lucky any time we make it back home in one piece. Because the road doesn't care whether you're a family in a station wagon, a traveling salesman, or a touring musician. It's one long haunted house where the floor and the walls can come alive at any second, like any stretch of the interstate can just open right up into some filthy monster mouth and swallow you and your friends whole in one bloody, frame-twisted, glass-busting gulp. So Godspeed, you truckers, you vans packed full of low-budget independent artists, you small families making a big move, you protest kids, you poorly ventilated cargo bays crossing borders full of hopefully soon to be citizens. You night crossers. May the giant remain asleep beneath your tires and your destination meet your expectations like a victory riot at dawn. Amen. Thank you very much. So I'm almost out of time here. Thank you so much for listening. Um, before I go, I just want to wrap up uh, with some of uh, MLK's words uh, here. This is, you know, part of the letter that he wrote, you know, while he was in jail. Um, and he's talking about direct action. He's a, a group of white clergymen, ministers, church people put out a public letter criticizing him and the movement in Birmingham. Um, and, and he responded, you know, they were saying that you, you live in Atlanta, you have no business organizing in Birmingham. Yes, we believe in equality for everybody, but now isn't the time. Your tactics are too aggressive. And, you know, he's writing this letter in response to them from jail. You know, he says, You may well ask why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches, and so forth? Isn't negotiation a better path? You are quite right in calling for negotiation. Indeed, this is the very purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community, community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks to dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. 
My citing and creation of tension as part of the work of the nonviolent resistor may sound rather shocking, but I must confess that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly opposed violent tension, but there is a type of constructive nonviolent tension which is necessary for growth. Just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and half-truths to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal, so must we see the need for nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help men rise from the dark paths, dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding, and brotherhood, and sisterhood. The purpose of our direct action program is to create a situation so, Christ, so crisis packed that it will inevitably open the door to negotiation. I therefore concur with you and your call for negotiation. Too long has our beloved Southland been bogged down in a tragic effort to live in monologue rather than dialogue. And I hear him say that, and it sounds just like he's talking about today. Uh, folks around the country, folks of color around the country are saying that folks of color are being unjustly stopped and frisked, profiled, jailed, um, and it's not being heard. It's no real action is, is, is being taken to change it. And he goes on further to say, and this is the last bit, um, you know, he's, I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and, and Jewish and, and white comrades. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride, in their stride toward freedom, is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klan, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in, in the goal you see, but I cannot agree with your methods or direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another person's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. And I think I would re be remiss not to note today that it's an honor to be here just to even be given a chance to speak and to listen to you all and be a part of this day. And it's a, a, a special responsibility because I am a white, hetero, cisgendered male in this country. I benefit from basically every kind of privilege that you can possibly benefit from. Um, it's a huge honor to be here, and I don't take it lightly. And I would put forth to everyone here, but especially to the white folks in the room, in 2015, it's time for us to really hear the message of, of Martin Luther King Jr. and admit that things are not fully equal and that things haven't changed. And it's time for us to do more listening. Uh, when folks of color in our community, in our country, are saying that there's a problem, saying that they're being attacked, saying that they're being isolated, saying that they're being unjustly dealt with. We need to listen and hear what's saying rather than trying to prove them wrong. And when we hear these prejudice statements and these racist statements, whether it's on Facebook or on Twitter or in the lunchroom or around our family table, it's time for us to not sit quietly even if we disagree with them. It's time to challenge them um, and to stand in solidarity with all working class folks, but particularly our folks of color who are up against some remarkable, remarkable odds and, and oppression. Think of all the unarmed folks of color who've been killed in the past few years. Uh, the names are, the list of names is, just goes on and on. Um, so I and keep myself honest and dedicated to the movement for the rest of the year. I really, really look forward to marching with you today. There's no place I'd rather be. Thank you very much.
uh, a man who came down to this community recognizing the need um, to address the issues of poverty, the, the economic gap that exists in this region, as well as the educational gap, who has been a champion for not only just um, young people, but all people in our community, and he's somebody that has helped support so many, and um, he's going to give a little address. Uh, his name is Jim Stevens. He, how many of you have heard of the organization Gift to Give? Uh, show of hands. Wow. Nice. Nice. So, Jim, welcome.
You guys had speakers, you had Angel providing the coffee in the morning, getting everybody riled up. Hold on, everybody stay there. When I say I have, you say the dream. Let's get it. Ready?
Um, see, he's from MLK. This is a very famous picture that he's painting, but he also has some amazing artwork. I see him in multiple events and a uh, talented artist, so make sure you guys see that as well. Make sure it sounds right.
before this victory is won, some will have to get thrown in jail some more, but we shall overcome. Don't worry about us, before the victory is won, some of us will lose jobs, but we shall overcome. Before the victory is won, even some will have to face physical death. Physical death is the price that some must pay. To free their children from a permanent psychological death, then nothing shall be more redemptive. We shall overcome.
Shall overcome. 